Madam Under Secretary, ladies and gentlemen, our distinguished guests, I would like to welcome you um, um, on Thursday for the first of the two days of the Black Agenda. Um, for uh, those of you who are here for the first time, let me just um, say a couple of uh, brief words about uh, the genesis. Uh, the conference has uh, two days and the first day is always uh, related to expert opinions. Um, also, uh, that is to make sure that the world of uh, practitioners is going to meet with the world of experts. Um, uh, myself and uh, my dear colleague Michal Smetana uh, are behind the uh, uh, organization of uh, uh, today's uh, panel. And it's based on a collective book project and intellectual project that uh, we've been running for a, a certain time. Um, it's going to be published in the form of a volume uh, with Routledge in the mid-2015 uh, and uh, uh, almost all the panelists uh, who are being scheduled for today uh, are being part of that project. Obviously there are also our uh, distinguished experts uh, on board who wouldn't be able to make it this year uh, or made it the last year. But this is just to make sure that um, I do a little bit of promotion for the book as well, which is always important. Um, now, without uh, unnecessary delays, I would like to open the panel, um, which is um, um, the first part of the book project um, on global issues and nuclear disarmament. Um, I'm going to chair the panel, and I would kindly ask the panelists to go uh, strictly for 15 minutes to make sure that uh, we have enough time for our lunch and the discussion over lunch. Um, I would like to uh, give the floor to uh, T.D. Paul, who is uh, our, one of our distinguished guests, uh, professor at the McGill University uh, in Canada. Um, and uh, T.D., the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much. Um, uh, let me thank you for inviting me to this uh, very distinguished uh, forum, which is actually uh, gaining a lot of uh, appreciation globally as one of the few places where uh, interesting discussions are taking place on a continuous basis. My paper is actually uh, more of a, a general uh, academic discussion, not too complicated, but uh, so specifics are not that I'm going to cover. Uh, clearly, I'm interested in the issue of why nuclear abolition is getting harder and harder in the sense after all the years of discussion we had say especially since 2009, there must be uh, some underlying reasons for these uh, difficulties this process is facing. So these are my own opinions. Uh, I may be wrong on some of the things I'm saying, but clearly it is an interesting uh, dynamics that uh, after 65, 70 years of uh, process of nuclear disarmament, the effort started in the 50s with At Atchison and Lilliathan plan, the Roots Plan, the 18 Nation Disarmament Committee, obviously the NPT, 1980s uh, efforts, uh, Gorbachev, Rajiv Gandhi, Australia Group, etc. As most of you know, the process has been going on. And obviously, the most important change is indeed uh, the credit goes to President Obama for bringing this back into the picture the first time since the ill fated Baruch Plan of 1946. The U.S. administration was talking about uh, nuclear abolition seriously that was in prior. So that is um, a, a interesting dynamics. And I just want to see from my own kind of little academic perspective what are the driving forces or what were the driving forces for this, for this process and what is happening to those driving forces that uh, are aware be better for the administration as well as the global community to think about disarmament. I categorize these into two sets of arguments. One is uh, uh, the normative foundations. Uh, the other one is um, uh, what you call the uh, structural foundations. And um, uh, third one, of course, the personal preferences of the president and, and his team, including, I believe, Madam Secretary, who's sitting here with uh, her own uh, interesting uh, perspectives. The normative arguments are indeed uh, coming out of, obviously there is a demand, a uh, long-lasting demand of the non-nuclear states. Uh, the, the grand bargain has to be observed by the nuclear weapon states, the Article 6 bargain, and then uh, the whole question that it was ignored during the uh, Cold War period, 
but um, it is uh, something that the nuclear weapon states have to uh, um, uh, fulfill, otherwise the NPT process may come to all kinds of difficulties, as we have witnessed already, and we have no idea what 2015 is going to look like. I'm sure we'll get some perspectives on that, and, uh, Bill Porter, etc., a uh, paper by Bill and others. Um, the structural causes to me, I think, are more important than the uh, normative, but it is um, important to note that the structural causes are actually now blocking the kind of progress that we were, we were hoping for. So to, to begin with, what are the uh, normative uh, reasons um, that people have been talking about? Everybody knows nuclear weapons are horrible weapons and their use might uh, create considerable uh, damage not only to the human beings and uh, the environment but to the certain traditions, certain norms that have been building um, for the past since Nagasaki. And so this is the foundational norm of uh, the taboo or the tradition of non-use that uh, I think will be uh, substantially challenged if any new state uh, or even established state uses uh, nuclear weapons. And there is considerable fear that that is not totally implausible given the way uh, some states are use, uh, developing them, uh, deploying them, and also using them beyond deterrence, uh, especially in the South Asia context that I can speak of uh, more uh, clearly. Obviously, President Obama's personal preference came into the picture as well. But I do think that whatever personal preferences leaders may have, um, there are structural impediments that sometimes are beyond their control, as we have witnessed what's going on with Russia and uh, other states. There is a foundational reason uh, of uh, desire for uh, this uh, disarmament probably comes out of the uh, fear of what he called the great equalizer argument, that indeed, um, nuclear acquisition by new states would uh, fundamentally alter the structure of international order to some extent, uh, I wouldn't say fundamentally in the sense that the great power system was built around the ability of great powers to intervene in regional states affairs that could uh, 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 undermine once they acquire nuclear weapons intervention or even coercion becomes quite difficult. Um, the complex nature of deterrence that emerges in the uh, different um, new theatres especially and the uncertainty with respect to the number of actors, the distribution of power as well as goals, ideals and issues that they hold all create complexity and ambiguity to deterrence as we know. Then of course the whole issue of um, great power is not having enduring rivalries or intense rivalry and uh, that was indeed the great opportunity since the 1990s. Obviously, it is now coming back to a new kind of rivalry. But the recessed general deterrent that served as kind of hedge uh, mm -hmm. was the argument. But I think people are realizing that there may be a, a kind of a limit to this sort of, uh, this sort of uh, weaponry. And so the new states that acquire nuclear weapons, or some are oh, still trying to gain, based on the idea that um, they can, um, they are needed for regime survival, which is a, a dimension that was uh, not clearly understood in the past. I think if uh, Iran, I mean Iran, North Korea, or uh, uh, even Pakistan, to some extent the desire is to maintain the regime uh, that is in, in charge. But the problem though is the fear of revisionist states uh, taking over nuclear um, control and then using it for uh, options that are beyond deterrence and I think that is um, the fear of the uh, revisionist nuclear power is not gone. Obviously the fear of uh, nuclear terrorism is there and that's why I call what you call the great uh, nuisance uh, problem. Uh, I must also say that the slow nuclear learning of the revisionist or the new nuclear states is something that we need to think about. The great nu nuisance argument is indeed not just terrorists gaining control of it, but it is the fear some states that hold nuclear weapons may collapse or be taken over by uh, non-state actors. Obviously, the greatest concern has been Pakistan and um, still remain to some extent, but um, clearly uh, think of Iraq, a nuclear weapon state, uh, if uh, it was uh, 
uh, able to acquire and today what would have been the state of that country. In any case, um, these are some of the concerns and I think let me focus the next five minutes on what are the impediments and all these things I said are problematic uh, achieving the kind of um, structural impediments I think are very crucial. And one of the most important structural impediment is the emerging power transition or, or even undergoing already in the international system. And that is we have now an established uh, great power, superpower, United States, relatively in decline. Then a rising power, China, and a resurging power that is trying to assert itself through a coercive means to some extent. And then, of course, the other aspiring power, India, and then its regional uh, environment. And here I think the biggest challenge is um, that there is no other weaponry or uh, uh, instrument the rising powers can really think of as uh, replacing nuclear weapons. They probably think this is necessary for their security, not really security, but preventing a, a power, transition, power transition war. A rising China may, may talk about disarmament, but it will be very interesting to see how far they will go. And I think Russia has already uh, shown to the world that it is not going to give up uh, nuclear weapons anytime soon, given that it doesn't have many other instruments. India is another country that, uh, although has been traditionally talking about nuclear disarmament, now it is facing what you call a trilateral deterrence situation. It is uh, acquiring systems facing China, but uh, Pakistan in between has, uh, in fact, more weapons and plans for some thousand nuclear warheads, it seems. And this may generate a considerable uh, complexity to the South Asian environment, and that is something that is not easy to manipulate uh, in the current environment. And obviously the existential deterrent that Israel uh, thinks or North Korea thinks, these are not easy to deal with until you have fundamental resolution to the conflict um, situations they are facing. Let me conclude by saying that um, now all the talk about disarmament obviously are uh, coming out of people who really would like to see the big change and I think that is laudable. But sometimes we forget about the political preconditions that are necessary for achieving nuclear abolition. And I think when we are in a disarmament mode, uh, it may be important to think about these conditions. What can we create? Uh, what kind of uh, structures we can offer to rising powers or declining powers or, uh, or regional states if they are able to give up nuclear weapons? And I think we have to think about um, uh, a, a lot more on the normative foundations, the structural foundations, and to suggest that maybe there are other ways to achieve security, which may be comprehensive, which may be regional based, uh, but uh, cutting out of the politics from disarmament is a major challenge, uh, at least from my reading of it, that is probably affecting the way we are uh, being uh, facing the situation today, that the political preconditions are not there these efforts will remain in uh, uh, limbo for a long time to come. Thank you. Thank you, TV. Um, I'm going to uh, pass the word to uh, Bill Potter, uh, who is professor and director of the James Martin Center for Non-Proliferation Studies at the Monterey Institute for International Studies. Um, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. It's a, a great pleasure uh, and a privilege to speak at this uh, distinguished gathering, and I'm grateful to the organizers for making it possible for me to return to one of my favorite cities. It also is a, a particular pleasure for me to sit on this panel uh, and next to my one of my first research assistants, <laughs> teaching assistants, many years ago. So it, it demonstrates. Uh, both uh, the accomplishments of, uh, of TV Paul in my own age. Uh, <laughs> there's obviously a, a great deal that could be said about the state of uh, global nuclear disarmament, which was the title for our panel. Uh, but given the opportunity that I've had over the past uh, nearly quarter of a century to participate in the NPT uh, review process, uh, I thought it made sense for me to focus uh, most of my remarks on the issue of the dynamics of nuclear disarmament as it relates specifically to the NPT. Uh, I'll also comment briefly on what I believe the U.S. role 
should be in advancing nuclear disarmament more generally, although as will soon be very clear, I most certainly am not speaking on behalf of the U.S. government, and I'm sure that Rose will testify to that, that, that fact. Uh, before I turn my attention to the intersection of the NPT uh, and nuclear disarmament, however, I want to uh, place what I see as a, a, a largely bleak uh, current situation in some historical context and to uh, note uh, two points in particular. The first uh, is that President uh, Barack Obama, I believe more than any past U.S. president, uh, has publicly embraced the logic of a world without nuclear weapons, including but certainly not limited to his forceful speech in Prague in April of 2009. Indeed, by early 2010, he could point to a number of specific achievements, uh, including a number of the points that uh, uh, Under Secretary Gothamuller mentioned, inclusion of the U.S.-Russian New START Treaty, uh, adoption of a U.S. nuclear posture review that placed reduced reliance on nuclear weapons, U.S. support for the 2010 Review Conference Action Plan, including 22 items specifically devoted to nuclear disarmament, and then we could talk about the 2011 uh, National Military Strategy, which among other things spoke about a reduction in the role and quantity of nuclear weapons in U.S. strategic policy, uh, a position that was consistent with the new defense strategy announced by President Obama in January 2012. So I point to those uh, uh, points as well as some of the other developments mentioned by uh, uh, Under Secretary Gottemuller uh, as representing not only a dramatic reversal in nuclear policy from the prior administration, but also as a unique period in U.S. political discourse in which new political space was created domestically for a discussion about nuclear disarmament. Uh, indeed, I, I would argue it's hard to imagine a more pro-nuclear disarmament national security team than the current one that surrounds uh, President Obama. Uh, that's kind of both good news and bad news because notwithstanding this uh, wonderful team that we have had, uh, it has been a very uh, slow going in the uh, move toward nuclear disarmament. My second point is that notwithstanding the notable headway that was made on some disarmament fronts during the first Obama administration, uh, the movement, I would argue, has largely stalled in the past two years due to a variety of domestic and international developments. Uh, domestically, uh, Republicans on Capitol Hill stymied much of the president's nuclear policy agenda, uh, ensuring a costly ratification process for New START and authority plans to ratify the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. Given the outcome of last month's midterm elections, it's hard to imagine gaining Senate support for any arms control measures, much less those that entail actual disarmament. Uh, unfortunately, the international environment hasn't been uh, much more encouraging. Even before Russian annexation of Crimea, Moscow had made clear its disinterest in further bilateral nuclear arms reduction negotiations with the United States. Uh, coinciding with Russian disengagement on nuclear arms control negotiations, uh, has been Russia's own nuclear modernization plans, as well as the abandonment of all practical purposes of its voluntary adherence to the 1991-92 presidential nuclear initiatives on non-strategic nuclear weapons. Prospects for multilateral uh, negotiations also have been dim due to the long-standing stalemate of the conference on disarmament. That being said, uh, one can point to the emergence of several promising new, two new multilateral nuclear initiatives. I'm not going to say much about uh, one of them, but I will uh, spend a little bit of my time uh, talking about the other. The two that I have in mind here are the open-ended open working group, uh, and the second one is uh, the humanitarian impact on nuclear weapons. Initially promising, although currently also undermined by the Ukraine crisis, is the so-called P5 process, which the Undersecretary also alluded to. And I'll say a little bit more about that when I turn to the NPT review process. Finally, for purposes of setting a historical backdrop for discussion of nuclear dynamic, uh, nuclear disarmament prospects in the context of the NPT, 
I think it's worthwhile to note uh, the continued growth in the number of regional nuclear weapons-free zones, as well as the conclusion of protocols to many of those zones by the nuclear weapon states, which take the form of pledges not to use or threat to use nuclear weapons against members of the zones. The most recent example of this positive development was the signing of protocols to the Central Asia Nuclear Weapons Free Zone Treaty by the five NPT recognized nuclear weapon states in May of 2014. Okay, with that as the backdrop, let me turn to uh, nuclear disarmament as it relates to the current five year uh, cycle of the NPT review process. I think the, the obvious starting point for a discussion. Uh, is the 2010 NPT Action Plan, uh, which, as I mentioned earlier, includes 22 disarmament items. Although many of these action items are significant, for most of the non-nuclear weapon states, none is more important than Action 5, in which the nuclear weapon states commit to accelerate concrete progress on the steps leading to nuclear disarmament contained in the final document of the 2000 Review Conference. To that end, they are called upon to promptly undertake a series of measures, including, and my list here is not uh, complete, but I highlight some of the major points, uh, rapidly moving toward an overall reduction in the global stockpile of all types of nuclear weapons, and the all here is important, Further diminish the role and significance of nuclear weapons in all military and security concepts, doctrines, and policies. Reduce the risk of accidental use of nuclear weapons. And further enhance transparency and increase uh, mutual confidence. I don't really have time uh, this morning to assess the implementation of Action 5 or the 21 uh, other action items something that has been done very effectively by my CNS colleague, Galhar Mukherjanova, uh, and also by reaching critical will in a series of monitoring reports. So here I'm only going to note that their assessments find little to be optimistic about an evaluation that pertains also to most of the other disarmament action items. But rather than focusing on the 22 disarmament action items, what I'd prefer to comment briefly on this morning is on two of the most interesting nuclear disarmament developments during the past five years, with the potential to impact significantly on the 2015 NPT Review Conference. The first was the initiation in 2009 of a process of multilateral consultations on nuclear-related issues involving the five NPT-recognized nuclear weapon states known as the P5 process, uh, the second was the emergence of an initiative to highlight uh, the humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons use. Both of these initiatives, I would argue, took on a momentum that probably was not anticipated by their architects, architects who could hardly have foreseen how closely their trajectories would converge and in some respects ultimately collide. In the case of the P5 process, launched at the instigation of the United Kingdom, and with a particular eye to promoting greater transparency, verification, and confidence measures, it not only facilitated adoption of a significant MPT action plan in 2010, but it's morphed into a routinized series of P5 activities related to disarmament verification, nuclear weapons transparency, and preparation of a common nuclear Disarmament. I feel a little bit awkward speaking about that given one of the key architects is uh, four uh, seats uh, beside me here. But nevertheless, uh, if I uh, misspeak, Rose, I'm sure you'll correct me. Um, but as, as the Undersecretary has noted, the, the next such meeting is scheduled for London in February. Uh, and although the P5 consultations and coordination on nuclear matters had existed uh, prior to 2009 and were most notable in the context of the NPT review process. The more recent formalized consultations had until very recently led to what I saw at least as a growing sense of solidarity among nuclear weapon states on a variety of disarmament issues uh, and a wariness of breaking ranks should one or more P5 members feel strongly about a disarmament matter. In the case of the Humanitarian Consequences Initiative, which took shape in the lead-up to the 2010 Review Conference, uh, there is no specific item in the action plan relating to
to humanitarian consequences. However, the final document does include consensus language about, and I'm quoting here, deep concern at the catastrophic humanitarian consequences of any use of nuclear weapons, end quote, and then continuing the need for all states at all times to comply with applicable international law, including international humanitarian law. That consensus, which was reached in May of 2010, however, soon began to erode as the initiative assumed a life of its own, generating great enthusiasm and support from civil society, and enlisting an increasing number of state sponsors, including notably some NATO members, for a broader set of measures. And the first real indication of this trend was the joint statement introduced by Switzerland on behalf of 16 states at the spring 2012 NPT PREPCOM meeting in Vienna. While wel welcoming the focus of the 2010 review conference on the humanitarian dimension of nuclear disarmament uh, language, it went further than 2010 in expressing uh, the utmost importance that these weapons would never be used again, and here is the punchline under any circumstances as well as calling on all states to intensify their efforts to outlaw nuclear weapons. The P5 appeared to be surprised by the buzz produced by the statement in Vienna, as well as a similar statement at the UN General Assembly in October 2013, which involved 35 co-sponsors, uh, but they did not react overtly to these developments. Their public stance, however, changed following Norway's attempt to gain their involvement in a March 2013 conference in Oslo devoted to the issue of humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons. The United Kingdom reportedly was initially favorably disposed to the idea of sending representatives to the meeting, and the US probably was a mixed mind about whether or not to attend. Unfortunately, Rose has left us that she can't confirm whether that was the case or not. Uh, Russia and France, however, were adamantly opposed to participation and ultimately succeeded in obtaining a formal P5 boycott of the Oslo Conference, uh, which was attended by 127 national delegations. Interestingly, the P5 explanation for the collective decision not to attend was a concern, they said, that the Oslo Conference would divert discussion away from practical steps to create conditions for further nuclear weapons reductions. Subsequently, a number of P5 diplomats also suggested that a focus on humanitarian consequences was a distraction from the more important mandate of implementing the 2010 Action Plan, a view strongly disputed by most non-nuclear weapon state diplomats. In off-the-record discussions, some nuclear weapons diplomats also confided that their governments had major uh, concerns that the initiative would inevitably lead, in their mind, to increase efforts to outlaw nuclear weapons, perhaps by means including a nuclear weapons convention that was negotiated outside of the traditional negotiating fora in which rules of consensus prevail. These concerns were reinforced at the 2013 NPT PREPCOM where 80 states co-sponsored a statement on the humanitarian consequences of nuclear war. And uh, this momentum grew further uh, at the UN General Assembly First Committee meeting in October of 2013 where you had 125 countries joining in one strong resolution, uh, a statement put forward by New Zealand and another 17 uh, uh, supporting a weaker statement led by Australia. Um, in addition to boycotting the Oslo Conference in 2013, the P5 also chose collectively not to attend the meetings of something which is not well known to most people even working in the disarmament field, and that's the open-ended working group on nuclear disarmament, which was a series of UN General Assembly mandated meetings in Geneva during spring and summer of 2013 for the purpose of developing proposals to take forward multilateral nuclear disarmament negotiations. Although the rationale for the boycott uh, of the open-ended working group was slightly different than that for, for the Oslo Conference, these dual actions underscored the increased importance members of the P5 attached to the appearance of unity among the nuclear weapon states. 
The disarmament rationale underlying this view was clearly expressed by a senior U.S. official, not Rose, uh, in a not for attribution meeting in late 2013, in which this individual explicitly stated that if nuclear disarmament is to be achieved, it will be accomplished due to intra P5 deliberations and not through deliberations between the P5 and non nuclear weapon states. In other words, as recently as a year ago, P5 solidarity was seen as likely to trump the possible benefits of joining an overwhelming coalition of non-nuclear weapon states on issues such as international humanitarian consequences. So I'm not going to go much more into the, the detail of, of international humanitarian consequences. Uh, there were expectations that the U.S. might attend the second conference in Navi, Mexico. Uh, those expectations were not realized. But as the Undersecretary has noted, uh, we now have a very positive decision by the U.S. to attend the meeting in Vienna next week, and it's my understanding that the British government has also agreed to attend, and I would bet my money, although I don't think there's any evidence of this, that the Chinese uh, would be foolhardy not to attend and will probably sh uh, show up, which would leave uh, two P5 members on the outside, uh, the Russians and the, and the French. So let me conclude my remarks by uh, an attempt to kind of look forward uh, on what we can expect of the nuclear disarmament front. Had I sought to answer the question of what was possible uh, nine months ago, I would probably have suggested the potential for non-legally binding unilateral measures, ideally reciprocal in nature, uh, to move the disarmament agenda forward. Uh, comparable to what was uh, undertaken in the 1991-92 presidential nuclear initiatives. In particular, at the beginning of 2014, it appeared that it might be possible to fashion unilateral changes in U.S. nuclear doctrine and posture that made sense strategically and financially, regardless of reciprocity by other, by other nuclear weapon states. There even seemed to be some prospect that fiscally conservative Republicans might support these changes due to budgetary considerations. Unfortunately, Russian moves in Ukraine and the setback to Democrats in Congress now make such unilateral initiatives politically improbable. Still, I would argue budget considerations probably represent the most viable means to achieve meaningful disarmament by altering nuclear doctrine and force posture in the short to medium term because they don't require congressional uh, approval. One of the most fertile areas in which the United States could distinguish itself in the disarmament realm while simultaneously advancing its non-proliferation agenda involves the promotion of nuclear weapons free zones, a key issue for the NPT. And although there has been some movement made uh, in this uh, uh, direction, um, uh, the key problem at the moment is gaining ratification of the protocols that have already been signed with respect to three of these nuclear weapons free zones. But there's another issue here that I want to flag, and there are others around the room who can speak to this in more detail if they want to. And, and that is uh, the imperative for those countries that have already concluded nuclear weapons free zones to fully implement them. And that means abiding by prohibitions in three of these existing nuclear weapons free zone treaties about trade uh, with uh, countries that do not have full scope of safeguards in place, namely India. Uh, I would argue that three, the members of three zones are violating their obligations. One potentially fr uh, fruitful and practical disarmament measure that I would encourage P5 states to revisit is the long forgotten but still uh, relevant draft treaty negotiated by the United States and the Soviet Union in the late 1970s on the prohibition of the development, production, stockpiling, and use of radiological weapons. This treaty was submitted to the Committee on Disarmament in 1979, but foundered there due to disagreement by other CD members over the scope of the draft treaty, definitional issues, and the relatively low priority attached to the subject by most delegations. Although the CD remains deadlocked over a number of issues, I would argue that P5 members would share similar views on radiological warfare, uh, might in fact be able to fashion an agreement as one of the next steps in their P5 process if in fact that process continues. And finally, the last point I would make, and here I'm particularly 
uh, disappointed that we don't have our senior uh, State Department official present. But I would argue that the easiest and potentially most effective step the United States and many other states could take to demonstrate leadership on nuclear disarmament would be to promote disarmament and non-proliferation education. In 2002, the UN General Assembly adopted a resolution calling for the implementation of the UN Experts Group study on disarmament and non-proliferation education. And in fact, Action 22 of the 2010 uh, Action Plan encourages all states to implement these recommendations in order to advance the goals of the NPT in support of achieving a world without nuclear weapons. Although interagency bickering uh, long prevented the United States from co-sponsoring statements and resolutions related to disarmament and non-proliferation education, I think it would be foolhardy for Washington to miss the opportunity to commit the modest resources necessary to become the leader internationally in training the next generation of disarmament and non-proliferation specialists at home and abroad. Should, however, the United States pass on that opportunity, it would open the door for many other countries, some gathered around this table, to assume that mantle of leadership uh, on one of the least controversial but vital disarmament issues. So let me conclude it, uh, on that note. Thank you very much, Bill. I would like to kindly ask Jenny Nielsen, who is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Queensland in Australia. Uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, and um, thank you to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and all the partner institutions for allowing me to share some thoughts on um, some ongoing research I'm doing at, at UQ on the evolving humanitarian initiative in the 2015 MPT review cycle that um, Professor Potter has just mentioned as well. So forgive any repetition uh, between our presentations. But in the short time, I'll aim to provide an overview of um, the nuanced engagement by states and the various nuanced aims and postures held by states vis-a-vis -vis, uh, this evolving um, humanitarian initiative. And I'll conclude with some possible implications for the NPT review process. There we go. So um, also, as Professor Potter mentioned, the evolving initiative has gained significant momentum since the inclusion of the clause, the language, deep concern at the catastrophic humanitarian consequences of any use of nuclear weapons in the final document at the 2010 MPT Review Conference. And it's slowly um, consolidating a discourse within the non-proliferation regime, including the MPT Review process. And stemming from an accumulated frustration with the perceived slow progress on the implementation of Article 6 of the MPT, this initiative is supported by an increasing number of states concerned by the consequences of possession and use of nuclear weapons, whether a nuclear detonation were intentional or to occur by accident or miscalculation, as we've seen those risk studies conducted. Um, so stressing the inherent risk associated with nuclear weapons and the unacceptable humanitarian consequences that would result from use, uh, these states are engaging with initiative, are raising this aspect and imperative in the various multilateral diplomatic forums, including the MPT review cycle meeting, the three prep comes so far, and the UNGA first committee. <coughs> Uh, with the initiative's increasing momentum and sophistication, this discourse or narrative has been interwoven into the multilateral fora discussions. Um, in addition to the first committee and the MPT review process, there's been the international conferences sponsored by some of the key drivers of the initiative. Uh, so we've had the Norway, the Mexico, and next week we'll have the Austrian uh, conference. And these provide a non-binding setting for dialogue and discussion on issues related to the initiative's concerns. Um, so again, it's not a non-binding, it's not the UN, um, so it should be a free forum to discuss this without um, agreeing on anything that would be binding. That's a key thing. So despite the growth of the initiative, the states engaged in, in its activities, the formal statements and by participating in international conferences have discernible nuances and varied names. It's not a cohesive initiative and it's an evolving organic initiative, if you will. Uh, the envisaged pathways, the pace of change, the ultimate aims of the initiative vary among its supporters. And I'll elaborate on this point shortly. 
Since the 2010 Revcon, there has been a concerted effort to drive forward the humanitarian rather than the strategic imperative in the multilateral discussions on nuclear weapons policy. And I'll just point to this slide, uh, provides a bit of an overview of the tally of states and support and engagement um, provided to um, throughout since 2012 Fepcom. The, the numbers at the bottom are the states who have either um, formally um, supported the statements or attended the conferences. And the two ones in the green are the alternate statements led by Australia in the first committee. So also that Professor Potter um, mentioned. Um, so you can see the numbers there, and I think Professor Potter went through them. So I don't need to um, rehash that in the interest of time. And um, again, notably Australia led that alternate st joint statement on humanitarian consequences. Um, also gaining support by 17 and then 20 this year. And the alternate statement including that banning nuclear weapons, state, nuclear weapons by itself will not guarantee their elimination without engaging substantively and constructively with those states with nuclear weapons and recognizing both, importantly, the security and the humanitarian dimensions of nuclear weapons debate. So these states would argue that we cannot um, isolate the strategic and security um, considerations that nuclear weapons um, are held by some states in today's security environment. Um, the initiatives conferences, including participation importantly by two uh, non-MPT states, India and Pakistan, um, but so far none of the MPT uh, nuclear weapon states have attended, um, but it's a welcome um, development that the US and the UK now will participate in Vienna next week. And um, this is particularly welcome in light of previous postures and some of the statements um, and language used by the P5 at the CD and other fora um, about the initiative. And um, we can roughly group uh, the support base and the approaches and the postures towards the initiative into three, okay, these are very rough categories. We've got the drivers of disarmament, and this includes the more active proponents of the initiative who see no role or value for nuclear weapons and security doctrines. And this group is likely to favor the delegitimization of nuclear weapons in the same way that chemical and biological weapons um, have been delegitimized, uh, so the new agenda, coalition countries specifically. Uh, these states are possibly those that will push for the discussion of a legal framework uh, such as was proposed by the New Agenda Coalition at the 2014 um, PrepCon through a, a formal working paper. And um, secondly, we've got these guarded or cautious supporters, and within this there's also a nuanced support within this space. And this group contains the more cautious observers of the broader objectives of the initiative, including such as raising awareness of the consequences and risks of nuclear weapons, also the aim to reduce the salience of nuclear weapons and security doctrines, the alerting and those, um, those steps that can be taken to prevent use or through miscalculation or um, accident. So these include notably NATO states, as Professor uh, Potter mentioned, and others also relying on extended deterrence arrangements. So some states are still participating in the conferences even though they um, are under um, deterrence um, arrangements and part of NATO, of course. So within this loose grouping, there, that, that further nuance exists. And um, even though they engage with the discourse and participate in the conferences, they might not support the formal statements. Only some of those states do. Um, that included four NATO states, uh, importantly. Um, and to what extent NATO states can actually reconcile their support for this initiative? When we heard, um, you know, Bill Potter also quoted that part of the statement that they support says um, that nuclear weapons are never used again under any circumstances. How can that be reconciled with ultimately within uh, NATO nuclear posture? So um, that is an interesting. Um, Interesting dilemma, I think, that those NATO states supporting the humanitarian initiative statements will have to address at some point. And um, further, the last group is the, the nuclear weapons states, the MPT ones, who have, to this stage, been quite critical of the initiative and in saying 
um, it would distract from the five step by step process and um, that the consequences are evidently clear and it requires no uh, further discussion. So um, the possible implications for the RevCon and beyond, um, I would argue that the initiative is, if it is to sustain that broad cross-grouping, cross-regional support base, which differentiates it from another single issue grouping, such as the MAC, the New Agenda Coalition, from the, the initiative will require um, careful management, I would argue, of this evolving initiative um, in order to sustain that broad support base, including NATO states. And, and I think that's what gives it um, a lot of its credibility. Um, so the initiative should, if possible, I know it's a loose grouping, it's not um, a formal grouping. Um, they should try to adopt a cohesive and clear communication strategy to dispel any misperceptions and myths that have developed um, throughout this process since Oslo. Um, I think it would help to have a clear distinction between um, the civil society interpretation and efforts and their activities, which are legitimate, of course, um, specifically, you know, ICANN, the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, and separate that from the formal state activities of this initiative. Um, because I think there's a lot of blurred messaging and blurred lines and signals coming out um, of this initiative, um, which should be clarified perhaps with a cohesive communication strategy, um, for lack of a better term. If this initiative is carefully managed, it could continue to sustain that momentum and broad support. If the drivers of, of you remember the three groupings, if the drivers push too far, too soon, in terms of pushing for a legal framework, uh, the more cautious, guarded support base will likely withdraw support, um, is what I believe. I could probably um, take this further as a train carriage analogy, with the splitting train carriages. If the, the drivers push towards a legal framework, I think they will detach that, that more cautious, guarded supporters. And um, with careful management, this initiative can harmoniously coexist with other disarmament efforts and can, again, be a non-binding forum for very important dialogue, especially as we heard yesterday that uh, prospects for arms control and um, right now is not great. Um, and again, the initiative is not a competing process or diversion from the existing disarmament efforts from the P5 and strategic arms control measures. Just as we have layered initiatives for non-proliferation, um, so we can have this um, layered measure for disarmament. And um, so broader engagement, including NPT nuclear weapon states, as we will have next week at Vienna, could very well improve the all-important atmospherics, to quote my former mentor, Professor John Simpson, at the 2015 REFCON and beyond. It's so important to have that positive tone, um, which is probably not currently um, enjoyed. With the palpable frustration brimming close to the edge, it, you know, held by the League of Arab States um, regarding the pending <laughs> Helsinki conference. Unless, you know, the P5 process have an ace up their sleeve to report to the BevCon on their progress following the upcoming London P5 meeting, um, engagement is really key, or at least to be perceived to be engaging with Article 6 and, and progress on implementing Article 6. And it perhaps can include the tone of the BevCon. Uh, if their goal is to achieve consensus for a final document at, at 2015. And, um, you know, it could have been perhaps more positive for the P5 to have participated from the start in the Oslo. Also in their interest to perhaps manage or steer the agenda um, of discussions. It's not so much, you know, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu, but they could have influenced where that direction of the um, conferences would have gone. So um, perhaps this momentum can also um, be channeled into, um, because of the concern of the impact of nuclear testing, the humanitarian concerns of nuclear testing, perhaps this can be channeled in the short term to promote a campaign focus to lobby the fa final Annex two states to ratify the CTBT as a short term goal. You know, if they, there's this momentum behind it, so this is and one of the key steps to creating conditions for a nuclear weapon free world. So I think that would be a positive channeling of this momentum and this um, energy. 
um, especially by civil society. So um, I think that could be a positive, and the nuclear weapon states could be could support that for sure. Whereas it couldn't possibly support something to to a legal framework on um, on, nu on nuclear um, abolition. And um, of course, just to remind you, in this 20, uh, 2009 Prague speech, President Obama noted that. If one nuclear weapon exploded in one city, it would kill hundreds of thousands of people. No matter where it happens, um, there is no end to what the consequences might be for our global safety, security, our society, our economy, to our ultimate survival. So, um, and much of these thoughts are based on a publication. This is the final plug to uh, finish off. Uh, that Associate Professor Dr. Marianne Hansen, also of the University of Queensland and I have written. Um, it was published this week by the EU Non-Proliferation Consortium as its latest non-proliferation paper and is currently available on the CIPRI website and shortly on the EU Non-Proliferation Consortium website, if not already. And, um, but that paper, given the audience, was geared towards the EU member state engagement with the initiative so far as we're looking at all the different regions um, broadly um, for a larger project. But I think I will conclude with that because um, we've already heard about the initiative and I know there's a short time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jenny. I would like to pass the floor to Tom Sauer, uh, who is Associate Professor at the University of Antwerp. Uh, the floor is yours. Thanks. Not many speeches by Prime Ministers or Presidents have inspired me but the one that President Obama gave in Prague did. So I'm very happy that uh, you invited me to speak about missile defense and the disarmament combination. Now, before coming to the point on the role of missile defense in the disarmament, let's say something about the technological effectiveness of missile defense, and secondly, on the relationship between missile defense and the deterrence. So the effectiveness of missile defense, despite the enormous amount of money spent on it, more than the Apollo program, is still very, very limited. Here we have to make a distinction between strategic missile defense and theater missile defense. From a strategic point of view, strategic missile defense is more or less meaningless, despite the fact that the Bush administration has installed dozens of strategic interceptors in Alaska and in California. The basic problem is not simply an engineering problem, but much more fundamental. Namely, the fact that simple and cheap countermeasures can neutralize interceptors in space. Therefore, any nation that is able to build ICBMs can also build decoys in the form of, for instance, balloons. And if the warheads launched to gather these balloons, the interceptor is unable to make the right choice between all those objects in space and therefore cannot eliminate the warhead. So we're talking about offensive warheads and defensive interceptors flying 5 to 10 kilometers per second. This is a problem that's generally recognized, also by the Pentagon. Theater missile defense, like Aegis and Taut, can cover a larger area than tactical missile defense. It is this kind of system, namely the standard missile street, either based on ships or on land, that is currently being installed in Europe to protect Europe from potential missile attacks from Iran. As they are also exo-atmospheric, just like strategic missile defense, theater missile defense, EMD, encounters just the same problem of countermeasures. So many tests with strategic and theater missile defense, none of which comes close to real war, Type of circumstances were failures. One wonders whether the immense cost, ten billion dollars per year, is worth spending it, except for the Boeings and the Lockheed Martins of this world. Worse, these systems create a false sense of security. People believe that they are protected by a missile defense umbrella, which in fact is not true. So let me come to the relationship between missile defense and nuclear deterrence. I'm going to also make the point that missile defense undermines nuclear deterrence. The latter is maybe not a bad thing, at least according to the many that will attend the conference in Vienna in the coming days. But by adding missile defense to nuclear deterrence as a defense instrument, the signal is sent that nuclear deterrence apparently does not work or not sufficiently reliable. 
but the accounts would be 100% reliable and would not need missile defense. So the US government has changed its mind over time. There's nothing wrong with changing your mind, as long as it can be explained. During the Cold War, the US argued that stable deterrence required the absence of missile defense, or very limited missile defense. Nowadays, it argues the opposite. It states that missile defense supports deterrence. According to the US government, missile defense is an extra layer on top of nuclear deterrence. Yeah, we can argue both ways, but this change of mind is intriguing and can hardly be explained by the technological progress made in the meantime. I assume it may have to do with the perceived decreased relevance of nuclear weapons and nuclear deterrence. Now, probably most important, regardless of the limited effectivity of missile defense, Russia regards US missile defense as highly destabilizing. Again, Russia used exactly the same argument that the Americans used in the beginning of the 1970s, when they tried to convince the Soviets to accept the ABM treaty. The problem is not so much the strategic missile defense systems stationed in the United States, as they are limited to a couple of dozen interceptors, each of which can easily be circumvented with Russian decoys. The problem is US theater missile defense in Europe, especially in phase three, of the Obama plan that is supposed to enter into force in 2018, with SM-3 missiles to be installed in Poland. As far as I can judge, Russia exaggerates the threat, at least for now. However, and this is important, if the numbers of nuclear weapons go further down, something we all expect, and if theater missile defense performs as it's supposed to perform, which is unlikely, but which is unlikely to be accepted by the Russian strategists, then the Russian deterrent may be at a certain point in time be undermined or even neutralized. Especially if the United States would install a lot of theater missile defense missiles, something which is not very hard to do. Especially if these theater missile defense systems are linked up with powerful sensors of satellites and radars. For instance, those used for strategic missile defense. The same argument applies even more to China, that has much less nuclear weapons than Russia. It was the US Bipartisan Strategic Posture Commission that claimed that China is indeed building up its nuclear weapons arsenal because of US missile defense. As a result, from a strategic and stability point of view, it would be wise to reintroduce a kind of ABM treaty. By the way, arms control may be the best way to start improving overall political relationship with Russia in the short term. Which brings me to the future of nuclear weapons and the role of missile defense. What role can and should missile defense play in the development? There are three schools. The first school states that missile defense can help to make the move from a nuclear world towards a nuclear weapons free world. I refer to President Reagan. Two arguments are used in this regard. First, with lower numbers, deterrence becomes less stabilizing, at least for maximum deterrence adapt. Missile defense may help to protect against breakout scenarios with one or a couple of missiles, or against accidental launches. Second argument, according to some, one of the conditions for reaching a nuclear weapons free world is to have an alternative ready. And missile defense is sometimes mentioned in this regard. But let me caution, if missile defense does not work, it is nothing more than a placebo. The second school does not believe that missile defense can help us on our way to nuclear elimination. And here I refer to President Gorbachev. Especially if missile defense would become more mature and or large-scale theater, theater missile defense is combined with powerful sensors, missile defense may be destabilizing, especially when the number of nuclear weapons dwindle. And the odds are that Russia and China will not give up their nuclear weapons if the United States keep its missile defense system. Furthermore, in a world without nuclear weapons, a country with powerful missile defense may come from the temptation to start building nuclear weapons again, as privacy and hegemony will be assured in that case. According to this school, the second school, missile defense is a destabilizing factor. A third school recommends to build a global missile defense system. A global missile defense system. The latter is to a certain extent only an extension of the US proposal to collaborate with the Russians on missile defense. 
President Clinton once stated that the United States would share the technology with friendly, civilized states. I quote, I don't think that we could ever advance the notion that we have this technology designed to protect us against a new trend. A threat which is also a threat to other civilized nations who might or might not have nuclear powers and not make it available to them. I think it would be unethical not to do so. End of quote. Many observers, including myself, however, believe that the global missile defense is not feasible politically because of mistrust and practically because of command and control issues. So in the short and medium term, we will have to live with both nuclear weapons and missile defense. In the longer term, and the Vienna Conference may accelerate the process towards elimination by starting to consider a ban on nuclear weapons. A world without nuclear weapons is best combined with a ban on missile defense given that missile defense provides a false sense of security. A ban on defensive ballistic missiles opens up the opportunity to expand the ban to include offensive ballistic missiles as well, which in turn will increase the prospects for nuclear weapons free world. That sounds like a radical new idea. It's, I think, the role of academics, especially from smaller countries, to come up with out-of-the-box thinking. But it's certainly not a new idea. I refer to the writings of Alton Fry and Laura Lumpen in the 1990s, and more recently by Steve Andres, who uh, worked in the NSC on the Clinton. Also, President Reagan, influenced by his Under Secretary of Defense, Fred Eitley, and Star Negotiator Max Kempelman, toyed with the idea of banning offensive ballistic missiles. President Reagan also proposed in a letter to President Gorbachev in July 86. So the whole ID is also an extension of the more recent ID to globalize the INF Treaty, proposed by Russia, and not to completely shot down by the United States, as far as I can judge. To conclude, the ban on ballistic missiles is much easier to implement and much more effective than trying to construct a reliable missile defense system that at the same time is regarded as stabilizing. It may be one of the rivers that Under Secretary of State Rose Guttenberg talked about this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. I'm going to um, open the space for the last paper, who is actually going to be presented by two of our guest colleagues, uh, Bern Kubik, who is project uh, director at Peace Research Institute in Frankfurt, and Christian Weidlich, who is research associate at the same institution. Please, the floor is yours. Very much. It's a big honor uh, for me to speak in front of such a distinguished audience, and the privilege to share with you some ideas that emerged uh, within the Academic Peace Orchestra at our institute over the last couple of years. The focus of my presentation, or of our joint presentation, will be uh, Global Zero and Beyond, Israel and the Middle East. And when U.S. President Barack Obama announced his vision for the world free of nuclear weapons in Prague in 2009, he did not mention Israel specifically. The country is, however, widely understood to possess a sizable arsenal of nuclear weapons that refrains from open admissions of its nuclear status. If the vision of a global zero is to become reality one day, the international community will need to find ways to include Israel into serious efforts of nuclear global disarmament by multilateralizing and finally regionalizing the Global Zero Discourse. Freeing the Middle East of nuclear weapons is however not a new idea. First efforts in this regard date back to 1974, when Iran and Egypt introduced a resolution at the UN General Assembly calling for the establishment of a nuclear weapon zone. In 1990, the resolution, which annually received support from all Middle Eastern states, including Israel, was extended to all weapons of mass destruction, meaning nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons. The latest initiative for zonal disarmament started in 2010, when the NPT Review Conference endorsed the objective of holding a conference in 2012 on the establishment of the zone of nuclear weapons of mass destruction and their delivery vehicles. Yet, as we all know, the planned health of the conference has not been convened. However, the formal consultations have been conducted under the auspices of Ambassador Jakodayev of Finland and Switzerland last year in this. So when we turn now to nuclear disarmament in the Middle East, we of course have to 
uh, see that most certainly this will not happen overnight. Therefore, we propose a gradual model, including short-term arms control steps, as well as intermediate and long-term efforts to regional disarmament. As confidence building will be the fuel of these processes, we believe that it's also important to include verification measures in all these steps. In this regard, we suggest taking the following building blocks on the path towards regional zero into consideration. First, advancing the ratification of the CTBT seems a fairly feasible step, as most states in the Middle East do not possess testable devices and show no interest in acquiring them. Second, enhancing the support of the additional protocol to the IAEA safeguards agreements as the gold standard for accepting intrusive control of nuclear activities. Third, negotiating the Fissile Material Cutoff Treaty for the Middle East, which would largely prohibit the production of fissile material, but neither affect existing stockpiles nor conflicts with peaceful purposes countries may envisage. Fourth, negotiating regional fuel cycle arrangements for instance, in the form of an international center for the production of nuclear fuel. Although these interim steps might contribute to enhancing confidence and strengthen reliability throughout the region, they can only help prepare nuclear disarmament. Most certainly, nuclear disarmament comes with many difficulties with regard to both proliferation and verification. Therefore, we suggest four scenarios which are worth discussing. First, all regional states declare that they do not have and never did have nuclear weapons. This would most certainly be the easiest case. However, some doubts would of course remain as to whether all or uh, some declarations would be true. Second, one or more states declare that they possess nuclear weapons. In this case, disarmament could take different forms. One might be that states volunteer to dismantle the program with full verification carried out by IAEA inspectors. Another option would be to fly out the nuclear warheads and associated materials for dismantlement, or to agree to bilateral destruction, following the example of the UK-Norway initiative. An alternative could also be to place the nuclear warheads under international or multilateral control with reduction only after to be defined period of peaceful relations. Third, one or more states declared that they did have nuclear weapons, but unilaterally dismantled them. And this option takes up the South African experiences, where Pretoria granted full access to IAEA inspectors who confirmed the dismantlement process by measures of backwards verification only afterwards. Four, one or more states declare that they no longer have any of their weapons in their arsenal, but refrain from discussing past activities. This approach poses the same challenges as the first scenario concerning verification and confidence between regional states. So irrespective of what the detailed approach to nuclear disarmament in the Middle East will look like, Verification and compliance with treaty obligations will certainly be considered key issues. The purpose of verification is, however, not to provide irrefutable proof of compliance or non-compliance. Rather, it is an exercise in confidence building, seeking to provide parties with enough reassurance that militarily significant cheating is not taking place. Focusing on the nuclear dimension Three institutional arrangements in the Middle East would generally be possible. First, all verification responsibility <coughs> is assigned to the IAEA. Second, verification is jointly conducted by international and regional authorities, as in the case of the European Atomic Energy Community or the Argentine Brazilian Agency for Accounting and Control of Nuclear Material, ABAC. Third, Verification is carried out independently by the IAEA and the regional board. Most certainly, the institutional arrangements 
will need to be agreed upon by member states and would have to suit and serve the political needs of the region. Considering the situation in the Middle East, which is characterized by details of mutual mistrust, not to mention the history of clandestine development of mass destruction in several countries, certain parties to the prospective zone have already indicated a lack of trust in existing bodies. This is why the region may need its own institutions for handling compliance issues. An accord on the abolition of nuclear weapons may only be reached if it were possible to reach agreement on a just and stable military balance or even a regional order in the absence of weapons of mass destruction. This necessarily includes also deliberations on conventional armaments and could involve confidence in security building measures and arms control of strategic offensive conventional weapons. Although the potential for such an agreement is admittedly low, a region-wide discussion about how to organize security in the Middle East in the absence of nuclear weapons and other weapons of mass destruction can already be considered progress. The willingness, for example, to conduct a joint review the regional military balance could contribute to confidence building with the spillover effects onto the weapons of mass destruction area. So concluding, arms control and disarmament cannot be achieved in a political vacuum where the singular issue of WMD non-proliferation can somehow be delinked from the complex and highly integrated security landscape traveling in the Middle East. Without an effort to establish a regional cooperation and security system, it is highly unlikely that efforts on the disarmament track will succeed. And therefore, regional states need to, besides discussing progress on the disarmament track, jointly develop a shared vision of the future regional landscape and strengthen their efforts towards peace and development. Thank you so much indeed. The German saying is, if the last one is bitten by the dogs, we'll see what I can provide in your insights. And, but let me thank you first, the organizers, for having me with us. Uh, Prague is competing uh, with Berlin as my favorite capital, and in this week it's clearly Prague. Oh, I see. <laughs> let me be a proliferator of some optimism regarding the Helsinki conference that has been mentioned a couple of times, uh, the conference that was envisaged by the international community in May 2010. And uh, let me spread some optimism. Amidst civil war in Syria, uh, wars, upheavals, and dictators coming back, we have since October last year to May this year experience that after a while of 90 years, almost all states from the region have gathered uh, five times in Lyon, in Switzerland, and in Geneva. I think these were informal talks led and invited by Ambassador uh, Jako Lajava. Uh, although the last meeting in Cyprus, which want, used to be, wanted to, was envisaged for, I think, June or August, did not uh, take place, I would say this is a major accomplishment showing that a communication process has been established, although on the informal level. In that respect, the glass, from my view, is half full although Cyprus tells us it, it's not completely My second point, case of somewhat optimism, is that the talks of the FIFA E3 plus 1, E3 plus 3, 5 plus 1, with Iran have been extended a second time to July 1st next year. Again, it's uh, the original goal of having an accord, comprehensive nuclear deal with Iran by July 20th did not occur again. All parties have agreed that this will be extended again. So I would say 
another proof that there is cause for some optimism. And uh, I think, let's face it, this kind of agreement that is envisaged, if it's successful, could change the entire political landscape in the Middle East. And I'm sure a, if a comprehensive nuclear accord will be reached, it will not be at the expense of the security of Israel or Saudi Arabia and other allies of the United States. Nevertheless, the talks are stalled, and the conference, which was supposed to take place in 2012, has not taken place yet. Time is running out. The entity conference will be, as we have heard, in April and May next year. So the window of opportunity is, is closing. The sticking points, as far as we as Track 2 observers know, are the traditional one, and on Mr. Lagava's informal agenda, this concerns number 4.5a and 5b. 5a representing the Egyptian and Arab League position, saying the mandate is that a nuclear weapons free zone plus biological plus chemical weapons free zone plus the delivery vehicles will be discussed. 5b is the Israeli position claiming and saying, I think with good reasons, that the regional issues should have a point and a position on the agenda. So far, these positions reflecting different security conceptions for the region have not been reconciled. And again, time is running out for doing this, but uh, let me tell you why I am a little bit optimistic in putting the current stalled talks into perspective. The first one is that all nuclear zones, free zones that have been established, took place at least required around 40 years and more with no weapon states in place like uh, that law. Israel is supposed to be, I think, is a nuclear weapon state, so it's an increasing, an additional big stumbling block which has to be taken into account. The second cause for some optimism, putting at least the current stall talks into perspective, is the fact that just the bilateral talks we had during the Cold War took six years, the INF agreement, and others many, many years. So I think what one should learn for, the, for these from these experiences is that patience is a vital factor in regarding these things and not becoming uh, cynical, although again, time is running out. What does this mean for the NPT review conference? In case that the Helsinki, the official one, will not take place, I think one should endorse uh, the informal processes, the communication process that has been established. And secondly, of course, a reality check will be important. Uh, one should not, as the, if the Helsinki conference does not take place, I think one should not continue in New York at the Entity Review Conference in doing business as usual. But I would say the ready to check could mean, first of all, the zonal attempt, the zonal concept, is the only one that exists in the region despite all its conceptual limits. And as Christiane told you, it is the brainchild of the region. It's their own concept. And I think one should uh, remind, especially the actors from the regions, on this to be credible in, in implement. I think the major, from today's perspective, with all clarity and, and caution, is I think the mandate that we have right now should be widened if possible and include the Israeli concerns. I think the major challenge is to get the only nuclear weapon state from the region which is not part of the entity process into the boat. 
And I think the only way to do it is to stretch out conceptually your hand to this country. And secondly, I think the Egyptians as the motor, I think this motor for the zonal concept should get a second one. It makes a Mercedes if you have two motors. One motor is not enough. And I think Egypt, again, should broaden its foreign policy profile. And I wish I wished new blood, new people would come in from Cairo and would complement the very narrow, from my view, fixation on the nuclear issue by integrating what is so far has been called the Arab Peace Initiative. I think the Egyptians should embark on this process too. What can be learned? As the High Commissioners here, I wished at this point of time the Secretary General, the Ban Ki-moon, together with, or Mrs. K, together with Ms. Gugemela and the Russian counterpart, should come together in public and make the case for a health and heat conference. My question is, shouldn't be this the right moment in advancing such a move? I can tell you, we at PREF, and I conclude with that, have our lessons learned, and that is we will be having a conference in mid-March on this issue, on the reality check in the foreign ministry, supported by Berlin and to some extent by Switzerland, and seeing how can we move forward and the options I've laid out could be one of them. We have been completing our cycle of 50 policy briefs on the WMD free zone and its delivery vehicles for Mr. Lajava and the decision makers in the region. And uh, taking up, um, Mr. Potter, your point on the educational exercise, we are is right now in establishing a what we call peace academies, which wants to target the younger people from the region, conflict region, Middle East and Gulf, who are in the formative years and who can be influenced and uh, who probably do not repeat over years the same narrow mantra, but are open to the other side as an Israeli to the Egyptians, as an Egyptian to the Israelis, getting into their shoes and, and developing empathy combined with knowledge and capacity building. And if you think that this academy is a good idea, we provide you the opportunity to join us in terms of resources, ideas, and concepts. And I think it could be a good cooperative exercise. Thank you so much indeed for this. Thank you, Ben. Um, we have roughly uh, 22 minutes uh, for the discussion. Uh, I'm going to take uh, the series of three questions. I would kind of ask you to introduce yourself and also affiliate you with uh, an institution. Um, we need to unfortunately use the mics that we have because we don't have a portable one, but I'm sure that it's not going to deter you talking about that terms. Uh, that it's not going to deter you from asking uh, good and challenging questions. Yeah. Okay. okay, go ahead. Thank you very much. I'm Vladimir Kozin, uh, Senior Advisor, Russian Institute for Strategic Studies, Russian Presidential Administration. Uh, my country will definitely give a response to tactical nuclear weapons in the United States, still stored in Europe, and to BMDS assets in Poland and Romania. That's not alarming us, response or threats. What is alarming us, and this creates great concern amongst the top leaders of the Russian Federation and the rank and file people, is that this kind of things, T, T and W plus BMDS, creates permanent irritant between nations. That is irreparable thing. And I ask all esteemed gathering to understand this kind of 
feeling in, amongst ourselves. So, we are also worried about that uh, the NBC review conference will not be a successful one. But in order to evoke, to, to, uh, in, uh, to trigger on fruitful and constructive discussion, uh, my institute has suggested private capacity, WMT, free zone, as a draft. It's available, and I will be happy to distribute to the esteemed audience at the end of the day during the expert discussion of this matter. And final brush, uh, we have already explained to the US side that we have never violated INF treaty. But on the other hand, we put forward critical remarks for the United States government that it is violating INF in the form of using medium range and intermediate range ballistic missiles and cruise missiles as as a as a weapons to be intercepted by BMDS. That's the problem with INF violation of the United States. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. Uh, there's a question. Is there uh, and two? Please go ahead. Thank you. I'm Maria Ross Rubley from Australian National University, and I just want to thank the speakers such, for such rich um, ideas, practical ideas on things that can be done. I think overall there's sort of a, a grim picture on this armament, but there's so many practical things that can still be done, and I really appreciate that. I had a question for Professor Paul um, on that specifically. I, I agree with you that this armament has gotten harder. There's no, no question with that. But I wanted to ask you about, you had posed the normative and structural conditions that were influencing this armament. And your normative conditions seem to be mainly pro-disarmament, and your structural ones seem to be mainly um, anti-disarmament. And I wanted to ask you about that, maybe challenge that a bit. I think one of the big normative factors is that nuclear weapons bring prestige. That um, you know, if you have nuclear weapons, that gives you you know a certain cachet in, in the international um, arena. And one example of this would be, even though the U.S. is doing quite a bit um, in terms of stockpile reductions, U.S. spending on nuclear weapons maintenance is actually increased. So there's um, spending five times the amount on nuclear weapons maintenance that they used to, um, which means that the budget is about equally the same as it was in 1990, even though they have so far few nuclear weapons. And I think that leads to, you know, propping up this normative condition or this normative idea that influences state thinking on disarmament that nuclear weapons do bring prestige. And a structural condition that helps is pro-disarmament, uh, I think one you can put in your list, is advances in technology. Um, the ability for NGOs and states to work together using social media, Skype, teleconferencing, etc., um, has grown dramatically. And I think that this is something that has helped lead to a lot more col collaboration and work together in um, you know, disarmament efforts, which is certainly part of what has helped the humanitarian initiative take off. And in the same way, education. I know that uh, Monterey is working on online educational programs. And again, because of the advances in technology, this allows for the spread of non-proliferation and disarmament education in ways that we've never seen before. And so my, the, my main point in bringing these up is that these conditions are not unchangeable, that you can actually do things to change them. And so while I agree that there are, you know, sort of, it doesn't look too great right now, these things actually can be changed with effort, for example, on the part of the United States. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. I'm going to take uh, the third question for this round. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm Stephen Pike from the Brookings Institution. Um, and uh, I also would like to thank the panelists for their comments. Uh, I'd like to come back with a comment and a question from Professor Sauer uh, on the missile defense issue. Uh, first of all, I, I agree that you have to be very careful about the relationship between missile defense and strategic offensive forces. And at some point, if there's greater equivalence, you probably would want to have even legally binding limits on missile defense. But I would urge you to reconsider the idea of having a ban on missile defense accompany a non-nuclear world. 
And it seems to me that if we ever did get to that point where all nuclear weapons were banned, uh, and, and, uh, some, allowing some missile defense would be a, a hedge, it would be an insurance policy. Uh, and it might be an insurance policy that would be useful in getting countries to take that final step to no nuclear weapons. Uh, I'm not sure I would spend a lot of money on that insurance policy in a non-nuclear world, but I, I'm, not, I'm not sure you would want to deny people the opportunity to buy insurance. Uh, the question I have is, goes back to your comment about Russian concern about the uh, European phased adaptive approach. And uh, certainly when there was a phase four, uh, in which the idea was to give the standard missile the velocity uh, to intercept an intercontinental ballistic missile, I could understand the Russian concern. Uh, but uh, the, the uh, Pentagon concluded that they could not actually build a, a standard missile that would fit in a vertical launch block on U.S. Navy ships. It just wouldn't work. So they canceled phase four, which leaves you with phase three, which will have the uh, capability to engage medium-range and intermediate-range missiles. Uh, Russia is, like the United States, banned from having those missiles by the INF Treaty. So I, I, I'm not sure I see the military concern. And in fact, some Russian analysts have said phase three would not pose a concern or would not pose a threat to Russian strategic missiles. So my assumption has been that the main Russian concern about phase three is more along the lines of the political concern is that Russia simply does not like uh, American military infrastructure in places like Poland and Romania. But I wonder if you have a, a different view in how you understand the Russian concern about uh, phase three of the uh, European phase adaptive approach. Thank you for your question. I'm going to ask our speakers uh, in that order to address the respective questions, please. Thank you, Maria, for your uh, uh, very perceptive uh, set of comments. Let me start by saying that the idea of nuclear weapons or prestige or status weapon have undergone a lot of changes. As we know, early 50s it was associated with the great power status today. Um, that approach is slowly uh, not disappearing, but clearly not as strong as it used to be, other than probably France or uh, Britain up to the point. Uh, not many states consider them as uh, enough to give you the great power status. Obviously, this is a part of their panoply of power or the resources they consider uh, for themselves. But to exit from nuclear status is quite hard for an existing a great power state. So, so that is the challenge. It is not uh, adding this, but, but the point is that will they ever exit for, from what they got? Uh, my point, I think uh, I, my disagreement with, with you only on the point is that structural conditions to me are important for major push in disarmament. Uh, I don't disagree that uh, it is important that these preparatory works need to be done. But windows for uh, substantial change in world politics come only in small periods, openings. One was the post-Cold War period in the early 90s and the second one was the post 9-11 context. And both, unfortunately, were not used sufficiently by the P5 in particular uh, to push for major reforms and change in this area. My concern, though, is that the public is losing interest until there is another crisis or until there is a, some kind of a major fear, uh, public may not have the interest on the subject. So NGOs uh, are definitely important, but they may not be sufficient to create the kind of momentum within domestic societies, um, if the Russian-US um, relations don't improve substantially and if China pushes too hard in the Pacific theater, we may not see much of a progress even though these important steps are happening. So I think I would agree with you that it is important people uh, who are focused on it come up with good ideas and develop these strategies. But political lead from the top, it has to be top down in terms of coming with uh, uh, major transformative ideas and strategies. And that come only in certain cycles. Uh, some of them uh, we missed may come again. Tom? One question by Mr. Pfeiffer on missile defense. I can understand your point, it's kind of insurance policy in case we go to zero, uh, but on two conditions, it should work, otherwise yeah. uh, it's, it's psychological, and we have to assess, make that uh, assessment once we reach zero. Um, 
And secondly, it should be global. It should be for all states. And I don't see how that will be practically be possible. Otherwise, it's destabilizing. And other states will, will not agree with this discriminatory regime, just as they do not agree with the discriminatory regime of the NPT. And on them, the European theater missile defense system, I believe that the Russians always start about we're worried about uh, phase three and phase four. On the Russian and respond on the Russian. Um, yeah, and I agree that currently these theater missile defense are not a threat to the Russian missiles, but they worry that the United States can easily uh, build more of these interceptors and bring them to Europe. And if they, they link it up with strategic radars and, and uh, satellite systems, According to exact scientists, it is possible then to undermine the Russian deterrent. Also, American scientists, by the way. But I agree, there's also political, psychological uh, aspect in the whole story. Um, in addition, I think there's a threat perception difference between Europe and the United States on Iran. So maybe we in Europe do not believe that we need phase three. Thank you, Tom. Uh, there's already a response that I collected, and I'm happy to take uh, two more questions. Um, there's one, but there was also the gentleman over there. And I would start with you, and then uh, Janek. Thank you, Mr. Zlavin. I have a challenge to the car. I'm going to share the first time with the Iranian Iraq. I have a short comment about Brussels' power speech. Uh, that part which categorizes countries regards to uh, structural impediment, uh, uh, which Iran also was uh, uh, in this uh, group, and it surprised me because all those countries which you raised and mentioned, all of them have a nuclear bomb, but Iran never have had a nuclear bomb and never intend to have such bombs. Thank you. Well. Thank you. And Janek Ruzicka. Hola, my name is Jan Ruzicka. I'm from the Department of International Politics and Affairs. I've got three quick questions. Uh, one is for TV, and it's similar to Mario's, but goes the other way around. It seems to me that the normative dimension could have, well have become a structure that prevents progress. So I think that might be worthwhile, but because there is a complacency and uh, perhaps the tradition of no use and taboo actually prevent progress. The second one is for Professor Parker about the relationship between the nuclear weapon free zones and disarmament. It seems to me that the nuclear weapon free zones don't move a needle really when it comes to disarmament. So I would like to see uh, the, the relationship spelled out a little bit better if you could. And the last one is for Jenny, which uh, was a really interesting paper about the nuanced engagements by the state, but is not the point of the entire project to take things out of the state's hands. And therefore, the caution that you sound might well be justified that you might lose some of the states. But why is the veto power to the states and be concerned about the progress based on state preferences rather than the preferences of the civil society? Thank you. I'm going to begin with uh, Ben wanting to respond to one of the commentaries for this round and then the three respective speakers to be uh, addressing the questions. Thanks, Nick. On the WD issue that our Russian colleague raised, I think it's, it's not a matter to distribute papers. I think it would be good if, if um, your side, your government, were able to influence uh, the Arabic side, uh, but I, we, the reports and rumors we hear from Moscow are that your government, the Zorianov, is fairly frustrated with the Arab side and things do not go so well. But I think the major, uh, one major good thing is, and I'd like to add this to my, to my comments, is we have a new focused bilateralism between the United States and Russia despite of the Ukraine crisis. And I wish one could make use of it and, and, to, and transfer this into a real exercise and make the LCD conference uh, happen uh, successful and, and uh, sustainable. 
Second point on the IDF issue, we have discussed this yesterday, and I think we had consensus on the thing, on the issue that these allegations and counter allegations, accusations, I think, are the appropriate thing for the established INF Special Verification Committee that exists. It should not go public, uh, and it should rest there, and it probably has been politicized by members of Congress over the Ukraine issue. But I think it has been resolved nicely, these kind of things, through the Cold War in various treaties, and it can be done. One quick thing on the middle, on the missile defense issue, which we also discussed yesterday with the Heinrich Böll Foundation uh, conference here. I think, uh, before you came in, Mr. Piper, uh, I think the major issue between the Russians and the Americans on EPAA, the, the, um, the European initiative and plans here for the protection of our, our continent, I think is, is going beyond ranges. And I think it regards the basic different attitudes, a non-restrictive um, go-ahead uh, policy by your country, mandated by Congress, on the one hand. And I think the old traditional ABM-related uh, philosophy combined of restrictions, legally bound, combined with the nervousness and the psychological sensitivity on the Russian part that this Aegis ship is, is going floating around everywhere. It's not an EPAA, it's also a PPA regarding China. And so this is floating, it's in the Black Sea, it's everywhere. And I think if you see the Russian demands, they regard also the restriction on, on the geographical um, um, flexibility of the Aegis ship as a, as a sign of uh, not violating what the Russians think they're suffering. Thank you. TV? Uh, both uh, good points. By the way, I, I did not say Iran is a nuclear weapon state, but it is, uh, from a structural point of view, it is a good candidate for existential <laughs> deterrence reasons. But I would say that uh, what is changing is clearly two things. First of all, the initial pressure by the great power system, but now increasingly acceptance of Iran as a normal state and a, a stakeholder in the Middle East peace process, uh, what you call uh, the Five Town ISIS which I think will be very crucial. Uh, I thought about this is if the regime is uh, foundationally challenged by the great power system, that's when, like North Korea, it has a great incentive to go for a deterrent capability. That is the great equalizer. So if Iran uh, gives it up uh, in a big way, which may be not only because of the, the pressure, but it's also because the regime becomes a normal accepted uh, uh, regime for the great power system, especially for the United States and its uh, associates. Uh, your point, uh, Yannick, is very well taken indeed. Uh, I don't know you familiar with my book on traditional non eastern nuclear weapons, but I conclude by arguing that this tradition is a very fragile one indeed. And I think uh, that's something we have to take into account that it can create complacency, but then you come suddenly with this crisis and doctrines and strategies and technological breakthroughs. And obviously that is why we need more legal normative as well as uh, other instruments, proper instruments to codify the uh, non-use uh, tradition or taboo if you want to call it. Uh, preventive steps, technical uh, steps, and some of the discussion that's going on in these uh, humanitarian aspect of Bill and others mentioned should include something more than humanitarian consequences, but what can you do to prevent uh, use of nuclear weapons uh, even though there is some kind of normative prohibition? Unless we have that, um, we already know the humanitarian tragedy that will befall uh, the use of nuclear weapons, but the point is that we, have, we can take steps to avoid uh, escalation to nuclear uh, nuclear war. Thanks. Bill. Uh, yes, thank you for the uh, for the question about the uh, relationship of disarmament to uh, nuclear weapons free zones, and, and there are a variety of ways in which uh, nuclear weapons free zones uh, directly connect to disarmament as well as to non-proliferation. Uh, one, one uh, it's useful to note uh, that uh, today we have. Uh, nuclear weapons free zones that extend to countries which previously uh, had uh, nuclear weapons deployed on the territory and one would like to think that the provisions of uh, these uh, existing zones 
uh, preclude uh, their redeployment. Uh, I would say that the most direct connection, though, and I'll mention a few other connections here, uh, has to do with the, the protocols that are concluded by nuclear weapon states, uh, which offer essentially legally binding negative security assurances against parties to these zones. That is, the nuclear weapon states uh, pledge uh, not to use or threaten to use nuclear weapons against the parties to these zones. And uh, for many non-nuclear weapon states, that's very significant uh, and is uh, construed as a significant uh, nuclear disarmament measure. But it's also a function of the thinking on the part of the nuclear, non-nuclear weapon states parties to these zones, uh, where I think there is a, uh, a, uh, a greater uh, disinclination uh, to think of uh, national security in terms of nuclear weapons. What has been absent to date, but I think uh, where there is a potential for far greater uh, activity, is for this very substantial number of parties to nuclear weapons free zones. We're talking about 12 or 120 countries. Uh, to act in concert uh, with respect to a variety of disarmament uh, initiatives, both in the NPT context uh, and elsewhere. Uh, there have now been two international conferences on nuclear weapons free zones, and there's a third one scheduled uh, during the, uh, or either immediately before or during the 2015 NPT review conference. And I think what you are beginning to see is some recognition of the potential clout uh, in the disarmament sector as well as uh, in other areas uh, of these uh, countries that have uh, taken on their own initiative uh, arrangements that uh, have uh, made their regions nuclear weapons free. And so I think there is a significant potential for these countries uh, in the future to mobilize uh, for a variety of uh, disarmament means. Uh, there's some other uh, things that I could point to, but uh, not to abuse my, my time, which I did in my presentation. I, I think I'd better conclude, and we can talk offline more. <laughs> thank you, Bill. Jenny? Yes, thank you for your question. That's a good question. And although civil society has an increasing voice at these meetings and they have a session and a platform to put forward um, their, their views, the NPT is still a treaty between states parties and it's the cornerstone of the non-proliferation review. And I think this is the power of having the states pushing this initiative um, is that they can also raise this bilaterally, this imperative bilaterally in meetings and also with the nuclear weapon states and also such as the Latin American states adopted in the Cuba um, declaration um, that they would raise this at every opportunity at every um, at every opportunity in nuclear meeting. So I think um, I think that's that's what's great about this initiative is that it is state based um, and I think you know the high level of putting it this on the agenda on various agendas including um, they could raise it at the nuclear security summits you know states parties that are invited to that party um, civil society can and will still um, push forward on the ban and this you know why not you know that's what civil society is about is to push the boundaries and uh, the status quo. Um, as it's going to happen this weekend in Vienna with the ICANN Civil Society Forum ahead of the formal MFA uh, Vienna conference. Um, but I still think um, the states can put it, place it on a higher agenda and raise the imperative at um, other meetings. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. I'm going to take uh, the last question or a comment. Please. Yeah, thank you very much, Jacek Belica from the European Union. I have a question to Jenny Nielsen. You have analyzed uh, this uh, humanitarian conferences apparently in some detail, and yet in your presentation I haven't noticed uh, haven't noticed one issue, which is the changing name of the movement, because in the original NPT document there is talk of humanitarian uh, con consequences, stress consequences of any use, stress, use of nuclear weapons. And yet the conference to which many of us are going in Vienna next week is about humanitarian impact 
of nuclear weapons. So there are two changes. Do you attribute any meaning to these changes and what? Thank you. Thank you. Can your response, please? Thank you, uh, Ambassador Belucha. That's a very interesting question as well. Um, and I haven't thought about that very carefully about the name change and about uh, the impact and the consequences. Um, perhaps it's, it allows it to broaden the agenda of what's discussed. Um, but um, no, I'll give you the further thought to that and bring that back to you. But um, because it's an organic, evolving initiative and not formal, you know, the labeling is just placed. I think it still covers the consequences, but the impact might broaden the, the agenda to um, other areas, not just of um, I'm thinking whether it could broaden it to the testing issue, not just um, of actual use and possession. But um, I'll give some more thought and get back to you. Thank you for that question. Thank you. Um, I'm. I'm aware that there are many other hands and possibilities when it comes to the uh, extension of the discussion, but one of the jobs of the uh, good chair is uh, to make sure that we're running on time. So uh, I would like to invite you to uh, our lunch uh, to make sure that you're going to stay tuned and you will come back for our afternoon panel. I would like to uh, thank to all of our speakers, but also uh, to our uh, audience for uh, their respective papers and questions. Thank you very much. Will the 4 o'clock session take place? Um, 4 o'clock on your paper? Huh? I mean, this closed session? Yeah. Probably. Yeah. It's not quiet. 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 It's not qui